afternoon. For those who haven't been before, uh, my name is Michael Fleming. I'm last director for Global Sales at Seaco Tools. Uh, I'm going to be the host for this last uh, seminar today. Um, this is a quite unique solution for us. So Patrick is offering you still the screen there. He's actually in Germany today. He has to be two times at once. So he managed to get in virtually, and uh, in Germany they've got him physically. But it looks like it works really well, and he is there. Patrick is uh, a guru in manufacturing transformation, so uh, he has a lot of knowledge, and uh, for the next 30 minutes, he's going to share some of that knowledge with you on applied physics for machining nickel-based superalloys. And, you know, superalloys, nickel-based superalloys, uh, harmonics, in canals, they means, we always find them trying to machine, and this is a topic that's really, really valuable to us as, as uh, manufacturers coming to the supplier, machine tool builders, customers who are manufacturing these components. And Patrick's going to talk about the physics, so he's going to give you some of the technology behind that so that you can start to solve your own challenges when machining these materials. So without any further ado, I hand over to Patrick. Patrick, the stage is yours. And uh, welcome to the UK. Thank you, Mike. Uh, everybody, good afternoon. I hope everybody sees me and hears me. Can you raise your hands if you hear and see me? B because, uh, okay, because this is, this is quite a unique thing, at least it is for me, to be together with people physical in a virtual way, or virtual in a physical way, I don't know exactly what it is. Uh, I have quite a, a big challenge here, and I, I make most probably a basic mistake. I have 20 minutes and 37 slides. That's normally impossible to do, so I will have to talk very fast. But I had issues because, you know, if you, if you, if you have to machine nickel-based alloys, there is a big problem or there is a big thing that you should be aware of when you machine nickel-based alloys. There are no details. Everything is important. And that was the struggle I had in preparing this presentation. Leave out the details, keep the core things, but yeah, there are no details. Everything is important. So I, 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 I talk fast, um, but more in-depth information on this you, you can find in, in the technical literature we, we have on machining and machining physics. And of course, you, you know, we regularly organize master classes and, and, and courses on these subjects where you can register, of course, also where we, we have all the time to discuss really in detail the important things. My name is Patrick de Vos. My passion from when I was at university is machining. Uh, the physics behind machining, the science of machining, perhaps with a big word. Over time, my passion grew into machining economics, because machining is a technological thing, a technical thing, and that's fun, fun, fun. But we should not forget that companies do machining in their workshops, not for the fun, but with economical targets. They want to produce workpieces, workpieces you sell to your customers and you earn money with. So the machining economic side of it, and my real passion is, is knowledge and skills. Uh, gaining it and sharing it, sharing with, with other people in the machining world. Um, so that, that's my passion. I worked 38 years with Seco. And, and uh, I, 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 SECO allow me to gain lots of, of experience, expertise in this, and I'm so happy I can share it back with people in the machining world. Let me start very quickly. The background when we talk about machining physics is, is a model, is a concept we developed. It's a concept that describes machinability. Machinability in, in, a, in a scientific way a kind of a machinability equation with variables and factors. Variables related to the cutting tool you use, the features of the cutting tool, the blue part here in the picture, the, the, variable, the, the, the factors coming from the environment, the gray part in the picture here, because you do machining in certain circumstances. One of the circumstances is the workpiece material, the main subject here for today. Um, and and those, those things, relate to each other, interact with each other, and having insight how that interaction goes, that's what we could call applied machining physics. And there are subsectors here. There are the mechanical effects, and there are thermal effects, and tribological effects, and so on and so forth. This is the background. This is the, the scientific concept or model. 
solving this equation, how do you know you solve the equation correctly? Well, that's more pragmatic. Solving this equation and evaluating how you solved it is done by talking to people, the machining experts, they have their feeling, they have their expertise, and I know that's subjective, but there's nothing wrong with subjective in machining. And uh, a little bit more objective is uh, look at the tools after a while being used. Used tools tell you so much if you know what to look for. And we refer to, to that that method we developed to evaluate used tools as GTDA, it's a letter word, it stands for Global Tool Deterioration Analysis. It's something we discovered a bit by coincidence by having a problem, but I explain at the end of the, the presentation. Uh, this thing, the scientific thing, the technical thing, of course, needs to be uh, balanced, as I said before, with the, 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 the machining economic side. It's not just producing workpieces, it's producing workpieces in a sustainable way, in a smart way, in an economical way, in a productive way. And, and, and that part we should not, not uh, yeah, neglect, because perhaps in the end it's the most important part. Um, now, in that machinability model, one of the factors coming from the environment of the machining uh, concept, uh, uh, process is the workpiece material being machined. So, so workpiece materials, material technology, uh, that part, normally when we talk about these things, we, we people instantly refer to the ISO approach. It's a P material, uh, it's a steel material, a K material, an M, wh whatever. Now, uh, okay for me, but we should realize that, that this approach to machining is, is by now roughly half a century old. It goes back to the times that the materials which were machines were main, mainly steels and cast irons. Uh, and, and afterwards we have been doing some fine tuning and so on, but we have to realize that the ISO system basically based on mechanical properties of materials, the hardness and, and the toughness, is, is yeah, th there are gaps in that system when we start to machine super alloys, nickel-based alloys. Th th there happen things we cannot explain with the traditional approach. So we need a, a better model, a better concept when we machine material. And if you machine nickel-based alloys, you know very often, instantly, instinctively, people say, nickel-based alloys is difficult to machine. Ooh, difficult. Now, that, 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 that goes back to 50 years ago, when in this system, nickel-based alloys were not described. So suddenly people had to machine a material which was not described in the model, and they, 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 they first had no appropriate tools to machine those materials, so they, they already started on the wrong leg, on the wrong foot, because they used a tool which was developed to machine steel in a nickel-based alloy. Of course it didn't work well. But anyway, you took the tool, and then things started to happen that people did not understand. They said, Whoop, that's strange. And, and all, all of these phenomena which were not understood, the tools which were used, which were not appropriate in the first place, led to that labeling difficult to machine. Now, nickel-based alloys are different from steel materials. And that's the only thing we have to, to, to take into account. Different, not necessarily wise, difficult. Because if you look to the, the material factor, if you machine different types of materials, and you see here in the video steel materials, and for the moment you see cast iron materials, and you see hard materials and soft materials, you see a hard material at this moment, um, the basic process is the same, but you see differences. You, you see different things. For the moment, you see aluminium being machined. It's always the same thing, 
but there are differences. And if we evaluate those differences, if we try to figure out what is happening here, we find that indeed, as I said, mechanical properties is not enough anymore. There are more material properties we have to bring into the equation to understand how the workpiece material, in our case a nickel-based alloy, interacts with the cutting edge. And I want to briefly describe this, this thing here. Uh, first of all, with each of the properties, what do we mean? And secondly, how does it affect, how does it uh, complexify, perhaps, the, the machining process? Very briefly, as I said, the time is, is rather short. We talk about adhesion tendencies, we talk about strain hardening effects, we talk about low thermal conductivity, we talk about the hardness, and we talk about the abrasiveness. Intensive testing, which has been done over more than a decade, led to the conclusion that these five properties are, are the steering ones, are the main ones, the important ones, that, that helps us to understand the difference between a steel material and a super alloy, or a cast iron, or a stainless steel, or whatever material. You see here two examples. The example to the left is uh, the, the, the standard nickel-based alloy, alloy 718. Just for your information, I added here also a typical titanium alloy, because very often people say uh, nickel-based alloys and titanium-based alloy, it's the same. Nah, it is and it's not. There are differences. but. The main thing here is what you see, the blue area in the middle with the dotted line around it represents the impact of those properties on the machining process when you machine a reference steel material. And the orange part, the, the yellow part, indicates how these properties are in alloy 718. And then you see differences. To the left side, you see when we talk about abrasiveness and hardness, that those variables, those properties, have a lower impact on machinability in case of alloy 718. However, if you look to the right side, you see that adhesion, strain hardening, and low thermal conductivity have a much higher impact on the machinability of the material. That means that we later on, in our machining strategy decisions, in our tool selection procedures, in our cutting condition strategy, uh, cutting condition selection strategy, we will have to take into consideration adhesion strain hardening and low thermal conductivity as, as steering elements, as, as things that have to guide us through selection procedures. Now, uh, applied physics in, 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 in nickel-based alloys, as I said, I take these five properties now and, and just a couple of minutes for each one of you to let you understand what we talk about. And abrasiveness, abrasiveness is, is, I refer to it as the scratching effect. It, it's, it's like you, you put your, 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 your hands together and you use your fingernails, and if you do that, you will scratch your hand. People often confuse this with friction. This is friction. This is abrasiveness. Now, abrasiveness is something we have to take into consideration. Uh, for certain materials, it, it gives us more problems than for other materials. Normally, I say normally, for nickel-based alloys, it should not be a problem. However, there are some cases, see within a couple of minutes, how do we measure abrasiveness to, to, to come to a ration, rational figure to, to express it? Well, we measure it through measuring micro-hardnesses. Now, uh, not every company has, has yeah, a micro-hardness measuring machine, but, but uh, yeah, that, that's the scientific way. Uh, there are more pragmatic approaches, I'll show you directly one. But micro-hardnesses, abrasiveness, you know, in superalloys, there are, from a metallurgical perspective, quite some things that leads to that materials show a certain abrasiveness that we did not expect. I, I think on, on precipitation hardening effects, I think on carbide formers in the structure and things like that. Uh, from a more pragmatic uh, respect, we learned through testing that um, abrasiveness 
kind of relates to the carbon content in materials. Now, what I'm showing you here is not really a scientific thing. It's just something we noticed in testing. But carbon content, especially in, 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 in uh, nickel-based alloys, titanium-based alloys, when you have more carbon, you have more that the material shows a tendency that, that carbides are formed into the structure, which leads to increased abrasiveness factors. So that's abrasiveness. The second thing is adhesiveness and ductility. Now, uh, I, I always have problems in, in, in the English language to, to talk about abrasiveness and adhesiveness. So first we talked about abrasiveness, scratching effect. The thing here is adhesiveness. Adhesiveness is a physical property expressing if you bring two materials together, to which extent they show a tendency to connect. That's called adhesiveness. Uh, ductility of a material and adhesiveness kind of are the same thing. Now, if this happens, and super alloys, nickel-based alloys, show this tendency more than steel materials, uh, there is something formed, I think you all know, it's called a build-up edge. And build-up edges are trouble. So adhesiveness, in case of Super alloys is something you have to watch out for because it would lead to build-up edges and build-up edges are going to destroy yeah, everything in the process. The ship formation will be different. The surface roughnesses of the machine surface will be different. If you see microbugs on the surface, it's, it's adhesiveness effects you see. Uh, adhesiveness is something to, to watch out for. Uh, more problematic, uh, really problematic could be potentially in nickel-based alloys is strain hardening factors. Now, what is strain hardening as a physical thing? It means that if you have a material and if you deform the material due to strain, to stress that appears in the structure, the material shows a tendency to harden. Uh, it's, it's, it's a thermal treatment, potentially. For some workpieces, we do this on purpose to create uh, yeah, more wear-resistant surfaces. Strain hardening, uh, some of you perhaps know it under different names. People talk about work hardening. Uh, surface hardening is another word people use for this phenomenon. The, the correct term is strain hardening. It's hardening of a structure due to strain, which is induced in a structure. How is strain induced by deformation? And what is machining? Machining is deforming material until it shares off under the form of a ship. So if we do machining, we could unintendedly create strain hardening in the machine surface. And that means that if you look after machining, that the, the surface and, and the video animation gives you an idea here, I hope, of, of that deformation taking place just below the cutting edge. Well, that deformation of workpiece material leading to a, a strain harnessed surface that is noticeable harder. The last graph to the right shows you from top to bottom, top is on the surface, and if you move down to the bottom, you move into the material structure, and uh, the horizontal axis here gives you the hardness, the micro-hardness, and what you see is that after strain hardening, the micro-hardness went up. And, 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 and this, this, is, this is so important to realize this happens, because this very simple thing is, is the... the is the basis on which we, we select our cutting conditions. Strain hardening effects in nickel-based alloys uh, are, are very important. You also find it in other materials, but in nickel-based materials, it could really be a killer of cutting edges, if you are not aware of this. And strain hardening goes even further. But, but I just want to mention it to give you a complete picture, because if you look to ship formation in, in, uh, uh, in uh, nickel-based alloys, what you see is that deformation does not only take place in the workpiece material, but the ship which is formed is also being deformed. So potentially, you create a ship with a hard layer, 
And that harder ship will lead to more abrasion. So in the beginning, perhaps you didn't expect abrasion when you machine nickel-based alloys, but during machining, due to strain hardening of a ship, it could be that the ship behaves much more abrasive towards the cutting edge than what you thought from the beginning. It's an aspect not to, to, to forget. I give you here three examples what we talk about. You see here traditional steel, stainless steels, and uh, alloy 718. And what you see here, the, the horizontal axis shows you deformation. The vertical axis shows you hardness in the structure after deformation. And what you see is that every material shows strain hardening. But in traditional mild steels, that's not a problem because the critical hardness for machining, which is somewhere around 350 Brinell, is, 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 is no issue. If you look to Inconel, the, 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 the hardness of a structure without deformation is normally below the critical 350 Brinell border, but if you start machining and deforming it, you create a layer which is, has a hardness which is above the critical border. And, and, and there you have an issue, not for the cutting edge cutting, but for the next cutting edge. And the people say, what do you mean with the next cutting edge? Well, the next cutting edge, think on a milling cutter. First tooth, second tooth, third tooth, it's one after the other cutting. Think on a threading operation, first pass, second pass, third pass. Think on, on turning pass after pass. It's, it's something you, you, we have to, to bear in mind. Talking about strain hardening factors, a, a little footnote, but very important is that we have to be aware of that in, in nickel-based alloys, there is also precipitation hardening taking place. Precipitation hardening, I, I'm not going to try to, to explain the, the metallurgical phenomenon here. We, we don't have, to have the time for that. But, but let me say precipitation hardening is, is that the material is hardening un, under the influence of temperature and strain. And, and you know precipitation hardening, that's what the graph tries to show us, takes place for most materials somewhere around the temperature of eight, 900 degrees Celsius. And, and life is not fair because you know the typical cutting temperature is eight, 900 degrees Celsius. So it could well be that next to strain hardening, you also do, while you do machining, precipitation hardening of the surface. And, and that is a double up situation. Thermal conductivity, uh, the fourth one, I hope hardness, I should not, that one I removed from this presentation. I thought everybody knows about hardness and, and how it affects uh, uh, machining and I had to, to, to save some time here. Uh, thermal conductivity, what is thermal conductivity? It is the ability of a material to transport heat. Uh, if you put heat in the material, to which extent will the heat spread out or stay concentrated? If it spreads out, a material has a high thermal conductivity. When it stays concentrated, the material has a low thermal conductivity. What you see here in the, in the graph, in the diagram, are thermal conductivities from different types of materials. Uh, and if you see t t typical uh, yeah, carbon steels, cast irons, they are somewhere around 50, 50 up to 100. But if you look to Inconel somewhere in the middle there, it, it's somewhere around 10, 15. So the thermal conductivity of Inconel is, is, is three, four times lower than the thermal conductivity of steel. Now, what does that mean? It means that if you do machining, heat is generated. And that heat needs to be evacuated away from the cutting zone. Otherwise, it would lead to a higher cutting temperature, which is a problem because it will deteriorate your cutting edge. It will de 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 deteriorate the cutting capacity of your cutting edge. So we don't like high temperatures. We don't like concentrated heat in cutting zones. And in normal machining, we count on that the heat is evacuated with the ships. And in normal, let me say, iron materials, that's rather easy because traditional iron has a rather high thermal conductivity. Nickel-based alloys, titanium-based alloys, have much lower thermal conductivities. The heat does not go into the ships. But the heat needs to go somewhere. Yeah, what does the heat do? Yeah, it doesn't go to the workpiece, eh? low thermal conductivity. Then it goes to the tool. And that is something that's going to affect the tool life very considerable. 
So thermal conductivity next to strain hardening, my personal belief is that, that thermal conductivity is, is the other thing you have to really uh, yeah, worry about. I don't know, I show you this slide, most probably you can't read anything here. It's, it's something we, we created to, to give an overview of, of all kinds of materials with a typical thermal conductivity. J just yeah, to, to, give, to give people an idea, if you are confronted with a material you do not know, that at least you have an idea what to expect. Don't worry if you can't read this here. Uh, these, these are available for you later on, so, so uh, just talk to, to the people there and uh, they help you with it. Now, talking about this, I also have a little footnote with specific heat. It's not in the diagram, it's, it's not in this pentagram, but specific heat is also something which is rather important when we, when we machine nickel-based alloys. First, what is specific heat? Specific heat is the amount of heat, it's the amount of energy you need to increase the temperature of something by one degree. Because metals, if, if you want to increase them from 20 degrees up to 21 degrees, need an, a certain amount of heat to do that. And, and when the volume you talk about is the reference volume, the heat you need, we, we call the specific heat. Uh, but if the material is already 800 degrees and you want to increase it to 801 degrees, that demands a lot more heat, a lot more energy. This is why the human race only in later times in, in development could produce iron. In the beginning they were producing bronze and so on, I talk about thousands of years ago, and iron came only last. Why? Because people were not capable to build ovens that could generate enough heat. To, to, to melt iron. With other words, one could say, and what you see here in the diagram, horizontal is the initial temperature, vertical is the amount of heat you need to increase the temperature by one degree, and the red line, the, the, the line peaking there somewhere around 80, 800 degrees, says that traditional steels, they have kind of a thermal wall somewhere around 800 degrees Celsius. And, and if you want to increase the temperature even more than 800 degrees Celsius, you need a big amount of heat. Now, in case of machining, from where is the heat coming? Well, from the machining process. And this also explains why you can use low cutting speeds, high cutting speeds in, in, in steel materials. The cutting temperature will always somewhere end up around 800 degrees Celsius in the cutting zone. But in, in nickel-based alloys, in stainless steels, the materials there, I hope it's visible, the ones in the bottom are most spectacular, 304L and 316L, austenitic stainless steels, they don't have that thermal wall. So even if, if, you, if you reach 800 degrees Celsius, a, a, very, a very small increase in cutting speed will, will continue to increase your, cut, your, your temperature in the cutting zone. And, and that is something, that's why cutting speeds are so critical in this type of materials. Selecting cutting speeds in steel is not, I, I should not say not important, but less critical. Let me call it less critical. But in super alloys, nickel-based alloys, ooh, it's, it's, it's very important, your cutting conditions. That means, coming a bit to a conclusion, that if, you, if these five properties we talked about now very, very fast, the adhesion ductility, the strain hardening factor, the low thermal conductivity, the high hardness and the high abrasiveness. Those things cause certain things to happen during machining, which would lead to a very specific tool wear. And working with that, coping with that, will help us, as I said, to select machining strategies, to select cutting materials, to select cutting geometries, with other words, to select cutting tools, and to select cutting conditions. It's, it's our guidance, these five things. Uh, if we talk about these materials, uh, to, uh, titanium nickel-based alloys, they are, they are quite the same thing. On the surface, they do not soften noticeable, 
because you have strain hardening, you have precipitation hardening, destroying a bit this system, and this will give you a very high local pressure on cutting edges. And we, we must be aware of, I talk a little bit more concrete, notch wear is very typical when you machine this type of materials. Very often, especially titanium, they have low modulus of elasticity. That means the materials deform easily. Be careful when we talk about quality of machine surfaces afterwards. This could be yeah, giving us some problems. And all thermal things done before we have to machine, or I should not say thermal treatments, but let me say the production method used to produce the raw workpiece before we do machining when we talk about nickel-based alloys, forging, precipitation hardening, and so on, are things we should worry about. Or worry is a big word. It's things we should be aware about, that they are going to, to, to give us some extra constraints when we do machining. High strength, elevate, at elevated temperatures is typical for these materials. It gives us high cutting forces, higher than what we expect from the traditional hardness of the materials. High toughness and ductility gives us bad ship formation, build up edge risk, side flow effects. We should be aware of that. Low thermal conductivity we discussed briefly. That means that the heat is not so easily transferred away from the cutting zone. The consequence is that the cutting temperatures are rather high in cutting zone, in the cutting zone when we machine these materials. And strain hardening and precipitation hardening, the little footnote I mentioned, gives us extra notch wear and will give us harder ships than what we thought in the beginning. Because you remember I said a ship is also deformed and a ship could also be suffering from strain hardening. General machining guidelines use strong tools. What do I mean with strong tools? Positive cutting geometries and sharp cutting edges. There are limits here, uh, be careful. Big depths of cut, medium feet should be your, your guidance. Uh, I know big depth of cut, you have all the things with vibrations and stuff. Within what is possible, select the bigger depths of cuts and be, be uh, modest with your feed selection. I know that some of them, or some of you now will say, whoa, whoa, wait a second, what about high feed machining? Everybody is believing in high feed machining now. Now, that's, that's, uh, that's not contradictory to what is said here. It's just in case that the big depth of cut is not achievable, then we reverse this statement, and then we say use big feet and medium depth of cut or small depth of cut. But, but again, it's, it's, it's a subject that deserves more attention than what I can give here. Uh, anyway, uh, feet should never be too small. The feet should always be big enough to avoid false cutting. False cutting is when a cutting edge is cutting below the cutting edge line. And then, then you, 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 you have a, yeah, a big number of issues to cope with. Limit heat development. Uh, you, you know, the heat is not evacuated with the ships. That means the heat stays in the cutting zone, increases the temperature a lot, and we do not like that. To take to this problem by, by, by its origin, it goes to limit the heat development. Limit heat development or, uh, yeah, evacuate the heat in, 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 a, in a forced way. Think on, on things that, that we, we call jet stream cooling and stuff like that is, is uh, yeah, very favorable in these cases. And most important, and now sometimes people say, ah, now we see he's talking for sickle. Uh, change your cutting edges regularly. Don't use them too long. Don't be, uh, how do you say in England? Uh, Penny wise and pound fo foolish, isn't, isn't it like that? Uh, because people think on saving some things and in the end they, they have uh, yeah, not really savings. And, and you know, all, all of this very nice, but then you have the reality. You, you know, I showed you this diagram. I said, okay, if you look to Inconel 718, Alloy 718, you have to worry about adhesion, strain hardening, low thermal conductivity. Now, if you look in the reality of uh, these materials, what you see here is, is a, a test we did in reality. And what you see is there is the reality of the combination of these five properties in different work pieces. And normally we say for Inconel 718, 
uh, use uh, sharp cutting edges. But if you have an inconel material where the abrasiveness is much higher than what you thought this was going to be, and you combine that with sharp cutting edges, you are dead. Huh? And that, that's what people worry about. They say, wait a second, I thought I understood it, and now suddenly uh, uh, it doesn't work anymore. And that's when her reality hits in. And with, with f being faced with that problem, we, we by coincidence, we, we developed something what we call global tool deterioration analysis. Uh, global tool deterioration analysis is, is saying, okay, I look to, to, to cutting edges, I see different phenomena. I, I see wear patterns, and I know in the background how the cutting edge has been used, the cutting conditions, the cutting strategy, all of that. Uh, and I can, from a statistical perspective, uh, yeah, rank different wear patterns into singular wear, only wear pattern on a cutting edge, or non-singular wear, multiple cutting uh, wear, uh, edge wear phenomena on the same cutting as I see preferred wear patterns, unpreferred. I, I can, this is the statistical approach that, that gives us the possibility to make a global picture, a big picture. Then I know which wear patterns I was, I should have been expecting. Because each of the five properties leads to typical wear patterns. As I said, strain hardening leads to notch wear. Now, if you think strain hardening is my, my thing in my inconel, and you see notch wear, good. You expected that, nothing to worry about. If, however, you see a lot of breakage, and, and you think, yeah, but wait a second, inconel 718 is not so hard as a, a corresponding steel, and breakage is an indication for higher hardness. So I see breakage, and I did not expect breakage. Ah, now you, you, you have a, a message from your cutting edge. Now you know something from your cutting edge. Your cutting edge guides you now to improve the situation. And, and that's what I said in the beginning. Uh, if you want to do smart machining, you, you know, minimum effort to, to maximize the result, uh, a, a smart approach is needed for, and, and that is, is the last thing I want to say here. I started by saying uh, there are no details when you have to machine nickel-based alloys. If you forget a detail, you will be punished. You know that. You will be punished in broken tools, destroyed workpieces, those things. There are no details. On the other hand, there are so many details. Yeah, People say, yeah, wait, reality is I don't have time for all of that. I need to machine. So the solution is uh, take a smart approach. Don't take the chaotic approach. Try this, try that, let's see what happens. Do the smart approach, the structured approach when you have to do this type of material. Basically, it should be for every material, but some materials, if for some materials, it's a, it's a bit more important. This is the light version. The quick version. I hope uh, I didn't talk too fast. You, you could follow a bit. Again, as I said, see the technical literature we have on the subject. Uh, see the different courses and masterclasses we organize, where you are all very welcome, of course. Uh, this was quite an experience for me talking. Is, is everybody still hear me? Raise your hands. Ah, yeah. oh, good. You that is. You you do it even more enthusiastic than in the beginning. In the beginning. Well. <laughs> Thank you very much. I hope it makes sense. Are there questions? Yes. Are there questions from the audience? Does anyone have a question? A lot of information covered in such a short time. Would anyone like to open up the question? Okay, well, there are some questions. We also uh, have a live feed on LinkedIn. So questions are coming through our LinkedIn live feed, so let's get past you in the, the phone. The first question, Patrick, from LinkedIn is, uh, what is cold reduction? Cold reduction is... Uh it's something that goes back to the tensile strength, a uh, tensile test. You know, metallurgists, they do tensile tests. They, they pull 
a, a, a piece of material, and then the material in, in the middle is, 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 is being yeah, reduced in section. That is referred to as cold reduction. I use it here just as an indicator to, to let you understand that the more you, you pull on a material, and that exactly is what we do in machining, we pull the material out of the, or we pull the ship out of the material, you, you, you have reduction, and reduction leads to strain hardening. There's No, but yeah, I, I think I, I do understand the question, but, and, and the answer is, yeah, that is, that, is, that is part of what we refer to as GTDA projects we run together with customers. It, it, it's, it's, you, you know, if you take the structural approach to things, it, it is possible to quantify and to qualify. But perhaps this question is so wide, we can continue the discussion after this session with uh, the person who asked it. And, and I have a question. Um, um, you talk about build up edge and the negativity around build up edge, but is there a situation that build up edge could be a protective layer for the insert to increase the light? Or is that just uh, wishful thinking? Who, who is the smart guy that asked that question? <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, uh, the answer is yes, but. We have to be clear then, uh, because you have build-up edges where a bulk of material in one place concentrated forms a bubble, a uh, build-up edge. The phenomenon the guy asking the question most probably is referring to is, is, is called build-up layers, where kind of where the two materials are in contact with each other and you have pressure and temperature and contact and chemical stuff, it can happen that, that a layer out of this chemical thing here, a layer is formed in between, and then indeed that layer, build up layers we refer to, protects the cutting edge. And it is possible to select for a certain tool in a certain material a certain combination of cutting conditions where that layer is formed and tool life is, is forever. You can use the tool forever unless an accident happens. Of course, we are not going to communicate the cutting conditions to achieve that. We have to protect a little bit our commercial interests also. Otherwise, yeah. But uh, I'm making just a joke now because most probably I, I personally think that those build-up layers is, is the, the next big development to watch out for in the tooling world. Finding tools, finding cutting conditions so build-up layers are formed while machining, which would give you two life, which is very long. Um, I only have a question. So I think, I guess one of the great things that you were talking about was the beautiful thing that you call the, the success of the generation of masters, but how important is it for you to actually put into a more AI processed way of doing this type of thing? Is it kind of performing at the same time as the AI? Do you think that's possible? Can you repeat? Can you repeat the question, please, Mike? I didn't hear it fully. Um, yeah, um, one thing you mentioned was the legal facing aspect of the TEPA. But going forward, do you think there's a possibility? <laughs> I, sorry, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm leaning forward, you know, but. 
Yes, fa very good. Okay, so you were talking about the beautiful um, facing aspect of UTDA. Yeah. So I was wondering if you believe that in the future it could go into a more um, using artificial intelligence, um, i.e. photographic analysis, to be able to determine the causes of tool deterioration, if you think that's a possible step that could be taken? Yes, very much. And I think that's the, the big challenge for you young people in machining, because I see a, a young person. I think, really, when people refer to as digitalized machining and digital machining and artificial intelligence, I think this is the domain where we should work. To, today, the knowledge for this is, is in the natural intelligence, in my head, in, in, in an expert's head, and it should be brought into artificial intelligence. Yes? That's your challenge, to make it happen. Happy? Thank you, Patrick. I think we're out of time now. We've gone over time. I'd like to thank you all for coming there. I'd like to thank Patrick for virtually scanning into this uh, piece. He's read the word really well. Um, unfortunately, not for you, Patrick, but anyone here, can you see it? Um, Matt, can I have my soft drinks in the Oasis, refreshments? after such an exciting day. Uh, Patrick, you'll have to get yours in Germany, but thank you so much for uh, joining us today in the UK. Uh, the system went really well, and uh, such an engaging um, seminar. Thank you. Thank you so thank much. Bye-bye, everybody. Enjoy the, the drinks in the Oasis.